Hi, I'm Bill Schmidt. Welcome to Hi, I'm Bill Schmick, and this is 30 Minutes. And we're talking about Social Security today. This is part two. On my first part, Social Security, when we went over the history of Social Security, and I hope it wasn't that boring. And this time around, we're going to be talking about some things that may affect you, and certainly your next generation, immediately. And some of those things, we're going to start by talking about the risk of bankruptcy of Social Security. Now you've all heard about it. It's a political football. It was a political football four years ago. It's going to be a political football this year, next year in elections. It's does Social Security go bankrupt or not? Do we have the money to keep it going? And should we keep going with it? Now, for those of you that didn't watch last week's show, I urge you to do so because I went through the origins of Social Security, and I didn't do that for a historical exercise. I did it because there are some misconceptions about what Social Security was developed to do, okay? Now remember, as I said the last time, it was the Depression, 1934, 1935, millions out of work, the elderly were starving, the droughts, the dust storms, it was terrible. And there was no help from anyone. And FDR came up with this insurance program. This insurance program that was supposed to benefit the worker, to give the worker a helping hand. He sold it to Congress. He sold it to the American people. And it wasn't hard to do. Okay, we needed the help. Part, this was part of the New Deal. But in all programs and with all politicians, there was a certain element of salesmanship to selling a social security and what it was and what it would be. And there are some myths or misconceptions of exactly what social security is. So maybe we should examine those first. There were some false promises made about social security from the very outset. It was, and I'll quote, according to FDR and his cabinet, a savings account for the old age of the worker held by the government solely for the benefit of the worker in his old age. How plain could that be? It was sold as a retirement insurance program, which one pays insurance premiums or contributions, okay, just like any insurance, life insurance program, to buy protection from old age destitution, okay, destitution not retirement, with one's contributions held in trust, in a trust fund, which will pay guarantee, guaranteed benefits as a matter of earned right, quote unquote, earned right, as Americans keep its compact between the generations, between us and the millennials, between the millennials and Generation X. How well has this worked? Well. The myth of Social Security is all of that was salesmanship. There is no such thing, okay? Look in the Constitution, Section 1101 in Title X1 or 11 of the Social Security Act actually explodes this whole concept that anything is guaranteed or that we have an earned right to anything, okay? It's not there. There is no trust fund, no lockbox, no insurance policy or retirement account, okay? What is actually going on is an electronic accounting system where a certain amount of tax revenues from all over the country come into the Social Security Trust Fund, which is a ledger, and then all the money that goes out is in another, okay? It's electronic, boom, 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 boom. There's no contractual right to receive benefits, okay? Why? Well, it, last time I had said to you that FDR and his cabinet, they were looking for a justification in the Constitution, okay, and couldn't find one other than a very nebulous clause about the general welfare of the public. And they leaped upon that as an excuse. But in fact, it's a very nebulous idea, and general welfare has translated into a whole system of perceived guarantees and trusts that were never really there, 
okay? So, the federal, let me tell you, the federal government has no authority under the Constitution to establish a retirement system, a safety net, an insurance program, a pension plan, a savings account. There is none, okay? The Constitution is mum on all of that, okay? And we've never done anything to change that. There's no right to provide disability. There's no right to provide death or survivor's benefits or to force Americans to fund these things, whether or not they want to participate. Now, this might all come as a shock to you, okay? But legally, there is no background to expect this. Now, the other thing, even in the salesmanship, and this is where we're all a little confused, Social Security was never meant to be your retirement plan. It was meant to protect you from starvation, from destitution, okay? Think back to the 1930s. During the Depression, people were starving. People had no food, okay? They, men and women were selling apples on the street, okay? They didn't have anything, anything at all. Social Security was designed to prevent the American population from starving, from being destitute, from being homeless. Starving, destitute, homeless, to me, doesn't equal retirement, okay? It's a safety net so that we don't see hundreds of thousands, if not millions of older people begging on the streets. But that, too, isn't retirement. Retirement, in my mind, is living a reasonable life, maybe not at the level that you were working when you were employed, okay, but being able to go on a vacation, go to a restaurant once in a while, maybe pay for your kid's education, or your own medical disabilities, uh, go to a movie. These are the things that, that I think of when I think of retirement. But there's a big hole in this country, okay? And what the hole is, is that so many people perceive Social Security as a retirement plan. It's not, never was intended to be. It's a safety net for the worst, at the worst. But today, it's worse, it's much worse than that because so many people are depending on Social Security for their total retirement. And they're coming up against the brick wall now. Now, I've done other shows. I've told you that the average American, if they're lucky in their lifetime, has only saved $30,000. I think it's over 50% of Americans have only saved $30,000 for retirement, which isn't going to last any more than a year or two in this economy. So it is true that Social Security, for most people, is their only source of income once they retire. And that has put us into jeopardy. But before we go there, let's talk about the Social Security bankruptcy. If they're true and the doomsayers say it'll be, it's bankrupt now and we're gonna, it's, in 12 years it's going to be a total disaster, the government on their side is saying, no, we have until 2013, 2034 before Social Security is bankrupt <clears throat> and we'll figure something out till then. Either way, okay, we're in serious straits. And the politicians that are campaigning for and against Social Security are... <laughs> building on the old fear and greed, Social Security is bankrupt, we have got to end it, or we have to change it, whatever. Well, rest at ease. If you're getting Social Security now, you'll be getting Social Security until you die, okay? If you're like me and I haven't taken Social Security, I'm not worried, I'll be getting my Social Security until I die. And I'll tell you millennials out there, the same thing for you because Social Security can't go bankrupt in this country. Now that's a pretty strong statement to say, but I'll tell you the truth, it can't, and I'll tell you why. Think about it, Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever party is in power, whether it's in 12 years or in 2034, when Social Security collapses, that political 
party will disappear from the landscape forever. Forever. Okay? And no party in this country will allow that to happen under their watch because it's political suicide. That's a reality and that's true. Now, the end of Social Security, whether it comes in 12 years or 2034, given what I just said about how much Americans have saved in their lifetime, the collapse of Social Security will impoverish tens of millions of elderly Americans. It will be very much like the Great Depression. Only the people that are be begging on the street corners will be my age or 10 years older than me. And believe me, Wherever you go, there'll be thousands, hundreds of thousands. The country will see millions of them. And they'll all still be able to vote. So, I can't imagine this country being willing to put up with crowded street corners of elderly homeless. Now, if Social Security went under, it would most likely be uh, a part and parcel of a general economic disaster, okay? Something that makes the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 look like a walk in the park. That's the only way I could see Social Security collapsing. But when it did, it would take the whole country down with it, okay? What am I talking about? The next Great Depression, all right? And we've learned from that. And the government and you and I, and we all know that with the end of Social Security and the collapse, an economic collapse of that kind, we would do anything, whatever it was, to avert that kind of disaster. And we would. The other thing is that the Social Security Administration is an agency of the United States government. Now, an agency of the United States government can't go bankrupt never has, without the government itself going bankrupt. So if they, at some point the Social Security Administration was bankrupt, then the United, you'd have to assume the United States will be bankrupt at the same time, and that's not going to happen, okay? Because this country and its politicians and its people are not al going to allow the United States to go bankrupt. This is not just the Social Security Administration, it's any agency of the United States. Okay, because the, the U.S. government guarantees the agency that it owns, it guarantees their solvency and their debt. End of story. So, the elimination of Social Security, if it were to occur, and, and I don't think it ever will, will result not only in the elderly being a, you know, homeless and so forth, it's, it would amount to a social upheaval like this country has never seen, okay? There would be massive dislocation, massive housing problems, social unrest, so forth and so on, okay? It harkens back to the Great Depression, and it won't be allowed to happen if there is a government, and I don't see why there wouldn't be. And then finally, the U.S. government, given all of the things that I've said, okay, all the political parties in this country, all the people in this part of this, this country, all of us, government, public, private sector, have too many incentives to keep the system, system from collapsing. So the realities are that in, in this respect, Social Security is just simply too big to fail, okay? And if we bailed out our banks in 2008 and 2009, what do you think we're going to do for Social Security in 12 years or in 2034? A lot more than that. So sit back and relax and tune out all of this noise about the end of Social Security because it ain't going to happen. So let's go to the Social Security today. Let's get a little bit dirty here. You might want to take a pad and pencil because I'm going to talk about the nitty gritty of what you and I are getting for Social Security today. <clears throat> the majority of American retirees, 65%, get half or more of their income from Social Security. That's a fact, stated fact. The two largest components 
of our income are Social Security and pensions, not investments. The problem with pensions, as you know, is from the majority of corporations in this country uh, giving pensions to their employee, now only, what is it, 12 or 13 percent of all corporations um, pay a pension. So, in the future, there's going to be a lot less reliance on pensions and a heck of a lot more on their replacement, which are tax-deferred retirement accounts, which you're probably familiar with. Those things are like the IRAs, Roth IRA, traditional IRA, I've talked about them. In work, it's your 401k plan, your 403b, if you're a nonprofit organization or, or a school or something like that. Um, it's that whole myriad group of tax deferred retirement accounts that the government and the private sector have cooperated in offering you. Okay, now, of course, you have to take advantage of them. You have to contribute to them, and you have to contribute a lot to them. And unfortunately, most Americans aren't doing that. As I said before, they're all relying on Social Security, which ain't going to cut it in no way, shape, or form. So, my advice to you is to start putting more money in those tax-deferred accounts if you're not already doing it. Now, a lot of people don't realize that Social Security benefits are taxed, okay? Now, and taxes are a function of two amounts of money. The total amount of Social Security benefits you are receiving are going to receive, and the amount of money the taxpayers have coming in from other sources of income. So, Social Security get benefits, other sources of income, okay? The higher amount of both sources you receive, the higher the probability will be that you're going to pay taxes on some portion of Social Security, okay? Because the two are looked at and added together. And if you come over a certain threshold, your Social Security benefits are going to be taxed. Now, I'll give you some numbers in case you want to know this, okay? You must pay taxes if you file a federal tax return as an individual and all of your income, Social Security, yada, 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 exceeds $25,000 a year. Then, if it does, then up to 50% of your Social Security benefits must be included in your gross income and report it as taxable income. Now, if that base is over $34,000 and not $25,000, then up to 85% of your Social Security benefit has to be included in your gross income and taxed accordingly. Okay? So remember this. Okay? If you, you're thinking of taking Social Security and still working, there's a cost-benefit analysis here where you know, you might be getting Social Security and 85% of it is taxed, okay? If you file a joint return, that is, with your spouse, and you have a spouse and together, the two of you combined, your income is over $32,000, you got to pay taxes on up to 50% of your Social Security benefits. If your combined income, you and your wife, is over $44,000, then 85% of your Social Security benefits are included in gross income and taxed accordingly. Now, the absolute worst case scenario for you or me is that we take Social Security before we come to full retirement age and you're still working. Okay, so as an example, your full retirement age is uh, 66, okay? Instead, you decide to take Social Security at 62, okay? And you're earning money. You're still getting a paycheck, okay? That's your absolute worst. Why? Your earned income limit is $15,720 a year, meaning that the most you're allowed to earn in that day job or whatever job or full-time job that you, you're pulling down the most that you can earn without your Social Security being taxed is $15,720 a year. Here's the proportion, here's just the truth. For every $2 over the limit of that $15,020, $1 is withheld from your benefits. And 
your Social Security benefits will be taxed as if you, if you exceed the $25,000 limit of income. Now that's, I know that's, that's sort of complicated, but what it's saying to you is this, that if you're earning over $15,700 a year, for every two bucks over that, you're losing $1 in Social Security benefits. And they'll be taxed at the same time. Now, how does it work? How do these tax work? What are you actually paying? Well, <clears throat> the employer and the employee, out of every paycheck, pay the government 6.2% of your earnings, and all earnings up to 118,500 bucks. Up until that point, you're paying 6.2%, every paycheck. Okay, for Medicare, I did not tack on another 1.45, almost 1.5% on your earnings just for the Medicare. Okay, now, Social Security, in order to qualify for Social Security, has a thing that they call credits, work credits, okay? How do you earn work credits? You can get four credits per quarter. Now, the number of credits needed for Social Security benefit depends on your age, but also the type of benefit. You can earn a maximum of four credits each year. That's one a quarter, okay? And you need 40 credits to qualify for Social Security. Okay, so most workers, obviously, you know, you, you don't have to work that long to qualify, but as I said, once a quarter every year you get a credit, that's four credits a year, you need 40 credits to qualify. That's the basis of Social Security. Traditionally, full retirement age was 65 years old. Okay, that dates back decades, okay? That's changed. <clears throat> now, for those born between 1943 and 1954, full retirement age is a year older, it's 66 years old. For those born between 1955 and 1959, the new retirement age is 66 plus two months for each year under 1960. Okay, so what do I mean? So let's say you were born in 1959, your retirement age is 66 plus two months. You gotta be 66 years plus two months old. For those born after 1960, retirement age is now 67 years old. You see what's happening? Okay, and I expect this to continue. We're fudging with the numbers. Okay, and over the next couple of years, I wouldn't be surprised if those ages grow higher, okay, before you can take it. So that, you know, instead of 66, you'll have to retire at 67, full retirement age. For 67, it might be 68, and the creep will go higher, okay? That's what I think is going to occur in an effort to try to unsquirrel the problems of Social Security. Now, you can get your spousal benefits as well. Now, how do you do that? Okay, husband and wife, whatever it is. To qualify for spousal benefits, you, you gotta be 62 years old, uh, or actually it could be any age if you're caring for a child, child entitled to receive benefit on your spouse's record, but that child has to be younger than 16 or disabled, okay? If you're eligible for both your own retirement benefits and your spouse's, Okay, so you're both, retirement age is 66, you're both 66. So if you're eligible for both of your own retirement benefits and your spouses, they're always gonna pay your benefits first. That's the way it works. If you choose to begin receiving your spouse's benefits before you reach full retirement age, 66 is your retirement age, you decide to take it at 62, your benefit amount is reduced and it will not be increased once you go back to your full retirement age. So your full retirement age is 66, you opt to take your, you know, your spouse's portion at 62, you work and work and work, you get to 66, you would, your retirement benefits don't increase, okay? Because you took them early. That's just the way it is, unfortunately. If you wait until you, re you reach full retirement age to apply for your spouse's benefits, you'll receive the maximum benefit, 66. That's your full retirement age. If you wait that long, you'll get full benefits. And how much is full benefit? It's up to half your spouse's full retirement age amount. 
So that's a pretty big difference, okay, to wait until your full retirement age instead of trying to take your spousal benefits early. And by the way, if you're divorced and your marriage lasted at least 10 years, you may be eligible for your, for your ex-spouse's benefits, okay, based on his or her record. And unmarried or disabled children and the widow of a deceased worker may also qualify for benefits. Let's talk about disability for a minute. If you're covered by Social Security and totally disabled before reaching full retirement age, you must meet three conditions. So let's say you're totally retired, uh, disabled, you're 64, full retirement 66. You've got to make these three hoops. You must satisfy the necessary worker credits within a specific period of time. Remember what I said? One credit a quarter, 40 credits to qualify. You have to, to qualify, okay? Your physical, mental, or physical condition has lasted or is expected to last at least 12 months or it's expected to end in your death. The disability must also be so severe that it keeps you out of work, not only the work you were doing, but all work. If you qualify for those, you're home free. Another arcane thing is how these benefits are all calculated. Now, benefits are based on your lifetime earnings. Earnings are indexed to account for changes in your average wage since the, year, your, the year's earnings were received. So if you were 19 and you were getting $20,000 a year and then changed jobs and you're getting $26,000 a year and then you went back to school and now you're making $40,000 and then it's $80,000, all of that is indexed. They keep track of all of that. So Social Security calculates your average indexed monthly earnings during 35 years where you earn the most. Okay, so it probably knocks out your, ten, your, your paper route at 12 years old. The form, this is an arcane formula, but it's applied to these earnings and arrives at your basic benefit, which is called a primary insurance amount. Now, the earliest age permitted to claim benefits, as you know, or you might not know, is 62 years old. But there are some drawbacks to claiming your benefits at 62 instead of your full retirement age. So let's say you were full retirement at 66, and you claim at 62 you're going to start taking benefits. Well, what will happen is at age 62, when you claim them, you're only going to get 75% of that primary insurance amount. The next year, 63, you'll get 80%. And then at 64, you'll get 86.6%, and at 65, 93.3%, and finally, you'll get 100% of your benefits when you're 66. How much do you lose by claiming early? Those claiming benefits, at least for this year, those who are younger, as I said, you're going to lose $1 in Social Security benefits for every $2 that you earn over $15,720. The earnings is capped to an index to inflation and increases every year. When is the best time to claim? Well, 62 continues to be the most popular time to claim despite the lower benefits and the higher tax disadvantages, but still people are doing it. And you wonder, why do they do that? Well, unemployment, that makes it pretty simple. Poor health, that also, I know that, issue. So that also makes it fairly simple. If you're unemployed or you've got poor health and can't work, the in inability if you're a hard labor person, man or woman, okay, you can't do the hard label as you get older. And of course, there's the fear of bankruptcy of Social Security. I know a lawyer who uh, has a good real estate practice and he makes a lot of money. He started taking 62, his, his retirement, because he doesn't believe that there will be Social Security over the next 12 years. So he's going to take it while he can get it. Even saying that, if you delay your benefits beyond full retirement age, okay, so let's say your retirement age is 65 or 66, and if you wait before you retire, if you love your job or whatever, do you know that each year that you delay Social Security, your Social Security benefit increases 8%? Now, the stock market didn't increase 8% last year. It certainly isn't increasing 8% this year. So that's a pretty good rate of return. Here's an example. So if you're 66 
and you continue to work and don't claim Social Security, each year up to say 70, Social Security benefits to you will increase 8% a year. Now, I was going into a number of um, Social Security loopholes in order to tell you that there are ways that you can enhance your Social Security income. Things that are called file and suspend, they're complicated, okay? Or taking uh, restricted claims on your spousal benefits. But I'm not going to do this and there's a reason. Even as I sit here and talk, there's a budget bill that's passed the president's on the president's desk right now. And as part of that bill, a lot of these Social Security claiming strategies have just been thrown out the door, okay? Another change in Social Security. Now, if you're hearing this show and you, you have been taking advantage of something called file and suspend in which you file for your Social Security uh, benefits and then suspend them, but take your wife's or your husband's um, spousal benefits, this is all changing as we speak. And I'm expecting for more and more changes in Social Security that's going to tinker with it, adjust it, and in some way ensure that Social Security in our lifetimes and for the millennials after us and for generations further to come will continue to get Social Security. Things have to change with the Social Security Administration. Things have to change with our retirement uh, attitudes. Things have to sh change with how we perceive Social Security. But I think the necessity and the facts that we're up against is rapidly going to change this both within ourselves in the private sector, in the public sector as well. But believe me, if you have any issues, any questions, I know it's a difficult subject and it's strategic for you and I to understand where you are in Social Security and take control of this and your life. Thanks.